Welcome everyone to our first ever inaugural Identity Hero webinar series. Uh, and today we're actually talking about unlocking the future of identity. I will be your host. My name is Mark Callahan. I'm on the product marketing team here at Strata. And we've got a really cool panel of people lined up today. These are, these are people actually I look up to. So this is actually really exciting for me to be able to talk to you all about this. Um, in today's webinar, we're going to be doing a couple of things. We're going to be talking about the future of identity with an identity Jedi, a, an I, IDM rock star, and a protocol guru. But we're also going to learn how to unlock some locks. We talked about unlocking the, the future of identity and where we're going. And I know a number of you in our audience got a whole kind set of locks in a care package from us, and we can't wait to walk you through that. So without further ado, I want to do some quick introductions. Who's joining me today? So as I look around the room here, I've got David Lee, who most recently, you're an identity troublemaker at Raincoat, but I think you're <laughs> possibly a little bit more well-known even as the identity Jedi. I think anyone who's been in this business for, uh, gosh, years now has seen you at every possible show and, and knows you very, very well. And so Welcome. Uh, we have Thanks. an IDM rock star who has a new Anarchy <laughs> podcast series, which I got to say is one of the most entertaining <laughs> podcasts out there. We always talk about how do you make identity fun? You legitimately make identity fun. So I'm so excited to have Adam Callen here join us. He's the CIO of Nidus, but also runs the Anarchy uh, podcast series. And Jerry Gable, who's the head of standards with us here at Strata, who, yes, had, is as we bring this extra bit of protocol guru to the table. I think we're going to have some really good dialogue today as we go through this. So just a bit of housekeeping for our audience members. We want this to be really interactive with you all. Obviously, Tom Fitzgerald, who is our guest co-host and is a professional pen tester and lockpick, is going to be sharing with us. I'd love to everyone to just in the sidebar right now, just give us a quick idea of who you are, where you're from, and maybe what company you're with. Uh, just so we get an idea of, of who all's here. And also raise your hand if you if you have a lock picking kit, because I got to tell you, Tom, when we got these in the mail, like I was expecting some sort of a cheap giveaway, considering that's what you usually get at an event like this. Not today. You have everything you need to be a professional lock pick. So we're going to have some fun with this. So I see that everyone over on the, the right side here. Great. Everyone's doing really well, uh, adding in the information. How about we do this? I'm gonna, before I give it to you, Tom, I wanna lead off with one question and I'm actually gonna pose this to our panelists and also to our, our friends at home, is who's your favorite superhero or actually I should say, who's your favorite secret agent or spy movie? Given one of the two, favorite secret agent or spy movie? And I'm gonna go first just to sort of seed the conversation. I think that mine is the Kingsman series and I can totally relate to Exit. I would love to be uh, a super agent that I didn't know I could be later in life. So, David, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Archer, hands down. Love it. Awesome. <laughs> Adam. Uh, I'm going to go with Napoleon Dynamite. That dude's got awesome nunchuck skills. It's like he's got a whole different, you know, kind of a character underneath the hood there. So, yes. Excellent. Excellent. And Jerry. <laughs> Yeah, I got to go back to the uh, older 007 James Bond movies, like from Russia with Love. And previous so to that, better. yeah, all go all good ones back there. Yeah. But, love it, love it. But what well, what Bond to... though? Like that that's about to ask. Which Bond? Yes, yeah. Connery. Oh yeah, Sean Connery for sure. Okay. okay. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a given. It's a given. <laughs> Unanimous across the panel. Well, without further ado, hey Tom, I think we're going to give you the floor now because again, I think everyone's sitting with their kits, going, "What am I going to do with all this?" Can you give us a little bit of uh, a background on? unlocking a padlock before we get into unlocking identity. You betcha. I should probably answer the question though about my super, uh, secret That's agent. That's a great question. So as a token Brit in the room right now, I've got to go Johnny English, who is the guy that played Mr. Bean. And it's like the Mr. Bean version of um, a super uh, secret agent. Given how bumbling and stupid I am at times, I can definitely relate to that kind of superhero secret agent. <laughs> Love it. Uh, we, Rowan Atkinson and, and obviously the Napoleon Dynamite were the unexpected things. And I think we're going to have a lot of unexpected <laughs> moments in the webinar today. So this is this is awesome. We all know each other well. And so it's, it's going to make for a fun conversation. So Tom, guide us through lockpicking and a little bit about why you're here to talk about it. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Yeah. So as Mark said earlier, I'm a physical pen tester. Uh, essentially, what that means is I am paid to break into buildings. Uh, should probably caveat this with I'm not a corporate spy. This is not corporate espionage. I don't run the risk of going to prison, and I certainly don't get paid as much as those guys. 
But I started doing this job because I wanted to become a computer hacker. Uh, it turns out I'm terrible at coding. I'm also extremely lazy. So I saw this job as a physical pen tester back in 2007. Thought ah, I could probably do that. Applied for the job, taught my way into it and realized I needed to learn how to lockpick to do it. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. So if you've got your lockpicks that we've sent out in front of you, you can open those up right now. I know it's kind of implied that, you know, don't touch them until the event. If you have already gone into them and had a play around with, that's okay. We won't judge you for it. But I'm going to teach you a little bit about them today. So we're actually going to dive straight into it. And the way I like to do this is we're going to do a little bit of talking right now. And then you're going to have a chance to play around and, and practice yourself soon. So I want to encourage questions. I want you to use the chat. Um, I'm going to try and keep an eye on what's going on in the chat. It's going thick and fast at the moment. So if I miss a question, don't judge me. We'll try and pick them out. But throw your questions if you have them along the way in there. Throw your heckles towards me. Throw your words of encouragement to your fellow lock pickers. We're going to just dive straight into it. Now, Mark, you asked the question, tell me about locks. So I've actually got a second camera view for this. We are going to be talking about the locks themselves. And we're actually only going to be focusing on one padlock. Now, I think we've sent most of you four, some of you three, depends where you are in the world, padlocks out. Uh, we are going to be dealing with this padlock for this session, and only this padlock. We'll send you some links on how to do the other ones, and you'll be able to reach out to me if you need it. All righty. So the first thing we're going to do when it comes to lock picking is I want to take you through what this lock is and how it works so that when I'm talking about how to exploit it, you know the individual components of it. So first off, this is what you're going to see usually. This is the kind of padlock that you're probably going to see. I'm going to use the term in the wild here. So uh, hanging on a garage door or on a shed door or a lockbox or something like that. This one you can't see inside of. But this one you can. This is the practice padlock. So looking at the individual components then, this part right here is the body of the padlock, the, the square plastic part, the black part on this lock here, the body of the lock. This part right here at the end, that's the shackle of the lock. And the shackle pops open when you turn the key. And this is what you hoop around your garage door, your shed door, whatever it is that you're trying to lock. If we push that close, the lock locks. Now, you've probably gotten this far in the past when it comes to padlocks. If you've ever used a padlock before, you probably know those parts already. But you may not have seen inside of them. And that's why we send you a transparent padlock here. So going a little bit closer inside of the locks here. Let me just center that for you there. Right. This gold cylinder running through the middle, it's called the tumbler. And if we turn the key, what you'll notice is the tumbler turns. So the tumbler turns and opens the shackle at the end. So in order to open this lock, this tumbler needs to rotate. Now, if we look below this, you'll see a bunch of springs. The springs have tiny little gold pins on top of them. These are called springs, these are called pins. Pretty easy, that part. We also have in the tumbler, holes drilled in that line up with each one of those springs. Now, if we take the key out, what we'll notice is that those pins start to disappear inside those holes that are drilled into that tumbler. So you see them sort of dancing up and down when I put my key in and out. Now, if we take our key fully out, what you'll notice is a bunch of these pins disappear at different levels and they get stuck inside of this tumbler. Now, if I put my key in just a small amount and then try and turn it, what you'll notice is that it doesn't open. When we put our key in all the way, all of these pins line up and it starts to turn and it opens. So essentially what we're looking at here is if we take our key out, these pins are disappearing inside of the holes in the tumbler and they are jamming the lock up. So it's seized up. We can no longer open this lock because there are little bits of metal jammed inside of the bit in the middle, the tumbler that needs to turn. 
Now, what happens is when we put our key in, those pins dance up and down and they align up perfectly. So you'll see how they're all perfectly aligned with each other. Now, in actual fact, what we've got is a pin here and a pin inside of the tumbler that you can't see. And there's a gap in between them. And the gap in between them enables this to move. But as soon as we take the key out, the gap disappears inside the tumbler and stops it from moving. So our key has a bunch of teeth, grooves, valleys, whatever you want to call them, cut into it that match the springs and the pins. And it sets them up so that they are perfectly aligned so that the gap in between the two pins lines up with the edge of the tumbler. It's called the shear line. So we're going to assume we don't have this key and we're going to throw it away. Now, don't actually throw this key away, put it aside. And we are going to dig into our toolkit to try and recreate that key. But like any good soap opera, we're not going to do it right now. I'm going to leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger right now. We are going to get into those tools. We are going to pick these locks. But I'm going to pass back to Mark right now, who's got a few things to say before then. I love it. I love it, Tom. And, and, and obviously, we were joking about this beforehand that we had to break this up into two parts. Otherwise, I think everyone, us included, would be you'd speed at the top of our heads the entire time as we're trying to fidget with these things to get these open. So yes, with that cliffhanger, we're going to get back into this at the end. But you're probably going, so where do the locks tie into identity? And why are we talking about like, you know, picking locks and how that ties into identity? And I think, you know, Tom, you'd probably agree with this is that locks really don't do anything other than slow down possibly the inevitable if a bad actor really wants to get into something. And I think we see a lot of the very, of course, same thing in, in passwords. And as we talk through the different locks that you shipped us, there's varying degrees of difficulty that people have in, in picking those locks. Uh, the, the simplest being the one that we're going to work on today, but then the one with the X in the middle, I believe it was a cruciform uh, security key. Yeah. And so as you think through like, you know, the evolution of passwords and, and where we are in the identity space, you get very much the same with locks, you know, but again, it's kind of just like a, a slowing down of the inevitable. And so as we think about what's what's next, what's the future, you know, as we think about where is identity going, how do we get rid of that inevitable? What, what do we put in place that helps it become security is security and identity is identity. And we're not worried about people picking a lock or having this kit or the, the digital version of it to get into things. And I think, you know, one of the areas, uh, David, Adam, I've seen both of you all talk quite a bit about as we think about this is, you know, what if the key is actually you? And and, and as we think about decentralized identity as, as in self-sovereign identity, as, as the, the identity travels with the individual and it's not owned by the organization anymore, it's actually me and, and I own this and, and carry it with me. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to get some thoughts just about, you know, we're all identity practitioners. What I love about all of us for is that we've all reinforced many times that we got to cut through the BS and the jargon. We just want to talk about like what works and talk about it in plain speak. So I think the audience will really appreciate some plain speak as we think about, you know, let's start with decentralized identity. Uh, Adam, can you give me just some of your thoughts about where we're going with decentralized identity? You're muted, oh, bud. You're on mute. And that's totally what happens when you do a live show. We automatically get muted when we get thrown into this thing, apparently. <laughs> so all Sorry my cool jokes that. are yes. gone. No, it's all good. Cool. So yeah, decentralized identity kind of depends on how you view from it. From an enterprise perspective, yeah, it's not there. It's, we're a ways away. We're still definitely in the education part, like teaching people what is decentralized ID and self-sovereign ID and all that kind of fun stuff. But in the real world, like are people using decentralized IDs? Absolutely, every day. Um, it's a really popular in the blockchain space because it uses wallets and those wallets are truly decentralized IDs. Um, and then a lot of companies right now, they're touting that they have decentralized ID products, I don't name vendors at the moment, but none of them are actually really decentralized IDs. They're more about verified credentials than decentralized identities because they actually own it. So the whole purpose of decentralization is that no single entity owns your identity, is that you own it. That's why it's called self-sovereign. That's the other synonym for it, right? So that's why this thing gets popular is the fact that with decentralized ID, there's no more breaches of identity data. There's no more huge publications of, oh, this plane company just had 30 million identities stolen and all your passwords are on the dark web. 
it doesn't work like that anymore because now it would be a single individual target. So a person could be compromised, like if their wallet was compromised, and they got their private keys or something along those lines. But there's no more breach of millions of users of data and then dumped on the dark web and reuse of passwords and all that kind of stuff. You could have a different identity for every website, a different wallet for every mm -hmm. website, whatever you want. So it really shifts the entire paradigm of where the identity is stored which reduces the risk, especially that an enterprise takes drastically. Because think about it, if, if I went to any enterprise and said, hey, I can guarantee you that you'll no longer have a, a risk of all your users' identities being stolen, how much is that worth to you? And the way to implement this with these wallets, it's free. What would you do? All of a sudden, people want to know a little bit more about that, about the tech. I love it. Yeah, David, thoughts you know, on your, on your side? <clears throat> yeah, like I, for me, it's... The biggest thing that I grab to decentralized identity when we think about this is like how how we build and manage this entire transaction, right? Especially on the enterprise side, right? So to Adam's point, right? Like outside of enterprise, you see it a lot with, with blockchain. Um, at RSA earlier this year, I gave a um, talk and I looked at um, Audius as an example of kind of what they're doing with it. It's in um, they're a you know streaming platform service, but the biggest thing is it it kind of moves us closer to what we do in real life every day, when you think about identity, right? So you you know who you are, hopefully, right? Like you, you have that aspect, like you know who you are. There's things about you that you know that you have. And if you have a conversation with somebody, right? Like if I meet a complete stranger on the side of the road, like we're talking, we're having information, I decide what information I decide to share with them. I can tell them, you know, my favorite color. I can tell them, you know, my favorite song, stuff like that or whatever, but it's, but it's all a decision on me, right? I don't just go out and just go, here's all this information. It's, it's, it's transactional and, and you decide based on that, whether it's a feeling of what you're deciding and where I'm going with that is when you look at the, the architecture for decentralized identity, it truly puts that back into the, into the user, right? So they present their wallet with their identity and say, okay, here's the information I have. And it's a transaction for an application to say, okay, well, in order for you to do this, I need to know, right? X. And when we, I need to know, let's say, I want to go purchase something. I want to purchase, I want to purchase beer, right? Uh -huh. So I need to know if you're of legal age to purchase beer. That's really all you need to know for that transaction. You don't really need to know my address. You don't really even know my full name. Like we just, it, it changes how we've thought about a lot of things with identity. Right now we collect all this information and we store it and we, we have these identity stores because it's like, oh, at some point we need to use this information. But like what information do we need to use at that point? It really kind of helps moves us to a more you know, kind of just in time transactional base. Like, OK, you just need to know that I'm over 21. So I can provide you that information. You check that. Now I can purchase the beer. We can all go on about our day. Right. Like that's not information at, that you had to store for me as a user because you literally don't care. You just want to sell beer. I don't give a crap where I live or what I like. I mean, you may from a marketing perspective we can get different from that. But for the most part. You don't have to store any that information. You just got to check. That's hey, right. dude's over 21. I sold him the beer. Good to go. Give me my, you know, 15 bucks. Right. And now I can go make more. And so to Adam's point now, it's like you can tell those enterprises like, look, you can do all this for free and it's easy. And you don't have to store any of this. Like sign me up. Right. But it does mean we have to rethink a lot of the things that we've currently done. Right. It's going to change a lot of the systems that we built in these enterprises where you're not collecting all this data anymore. And so now you really have to ask yourself, what information do I actually need to get this job done? Do I need to know every single information to process somebody's payroll? Or do I just need to know your bank account, your routing number, and an authorization? Really don't need to know like all this information I'm storing about you, right? It, it starts to kind of hit home on some of the things that we've just done for years because that's how we've done it. So that's the biggest and exciting part to me is like we really get to move towards this truly dynamic, interactive, like what do you need to do to kind of get the job done? Yeah, and then beer analogy is a wonderful saying. one too because you think about a driver's license. When I go to the liquor store, I'm not leaving my driver's license behind for that the store owner to do what they will with. You know, as a marketer, I love it, but no, that, <laughs> that's not what I'm doing, right? What we're talking about is a thumbs up, thumbs down decision and keeping everything else close to my chest, and I own it, and it's it, it avoids that that breach. Yeah. Well, to take it to the next level though is zero knowledge proofs, right? So it's take it. So right now, it's you're showing them your driver's license, and then they see it. Go okay, you're 21. I'll sell you the Jägermeister. I don't drink beer. So the next thing is with zero knowledge proof is we can use algorithms to determine that we have the proper values without actually giving you the data. So think of it like public private key passwords, right? It's the easiest one. And this kind of mm -hmm. ties back to real decentralized ID logins because you're saying, well, how do I log in without a password? So what you're going to do is you're going to send me a nonce, some random string of characters, letters, numbers, whatever. I'm going to sign that with my private key. 
and I'm going to send it back to you. And you have my public key. Now, with that, you can verify that that was signed using my private key, but I don't actually give you my private key to sign in. Therefore, you can authenticate me and log me in. We can do that with anything, not just passwords. We could do it with your date of birth. We could do it with your social security number. We could do it with all kinds of data. So if we mm -hmm. start integrating more of this zero knowledge proof transaction type stuff, at that point, we're not even ever turning the data over. It's not even going across the wire in clear text ever, or even SSL, which will get compromised anyway, right? So now we never relinquish the data. We just prove that we have the right data that you need to perform the transaction. And it's really interesting because we think about like uh, uh, data privacy as well. I think that kind of interesting is like, you know, geolocation, where are you? And, and, and you know, concerns about GDPR and others. If you think about it scale, trying to monitor where people, you know, as people are self-affirming where they are versus just simply it's already not yes or no. Is this person accessing from X, Y? There's a speed and, and angle in this too, which is pretty cool. And, you know, Jerry, what are your thoughts as, as we think about this decentralized identity future that we're getting into? Well, it's it's great to see how this this concept has evolved over the years. You know, we've been talking about this probably I don't know, ten years or more now, actually quite a bit longer than that. But to actually see it being uh, implemented is is really interesting and exciting to see. There's a lot a lot of positive things that can come out of it, like uh, Alan and David have, or Adam and David have uh, described here. But um, you know, I'm, I'm being the old guy in the group. I'm a bit of a skeptic as I get older. So I, I think we also need to have a balanced perspective. You know, what are some of the potential downsides or impediments um, for this kind of technology? I think <clears throat> I think zero knowledge proofs and selective disclosure of identity information is really fantastic. Uh, maybe for the youngest generation among us, but for us, I mean, all of our metadata is already out there. So I'm not sure how much benefit we gain from that, um, but for you know, the very youngest generations, I think that's a, a much more positive world for them going forward, for sure. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think you touched on something perfect because I was just talking to a CEO of a big identity company a little while ago, and I was explaining about decentralized ID and the whole type of uh, stuff. And basically, it all came down to this. One of his advisors said, well, we don't see market adoption yet. It's not that important. So I said, well, what would be market adoption? He's like, well, at least 150,000 people using it regularly. Like, well, with just MetaMask, there's 30 million every day. So basically anyone under the age of 30, pretty much like 70% of IT users that are under 30 are using decentralized ID for authentication and, and authorization daily. So you're, you touched on a huge point, which is a, a massive generational gap in how we're providing our identity to people. And the enterprise is, just doesn't understand where that, you know, I would say 13 to 28 age range is actually doing stuff in the real world. And the real world to me is just the internet in general. I love that one. Well, and we talked about, you know, um, also protecting, you know, from a privacy perspective, that same generation, Adam, you've talked about, you know, telling your kids, being careful about what they're, they're, they're sharing because it's in, in public oh, yeah. domain, uh, without a doubt. You know, I worked at Twitter for a decade and it was the same thing. It's like being very cautious about what we share in public domain, but in the same token, you know, Jerry, you know, you've talked to our generation saying, you know, we're very cautious about it. The younger people are not oftentimes just said younger people. I can't believe I just said that out loud, y'all. Okay, but the, you know, a lot of people don't care. What it, it's hard to argue against the don't care, you know, mentality too. Uh, but oh yeah, well, yeah. My mom sent me a picture. She's like, "Hey, check out my new door," and she's been sending it to everyone because she bought a new door for her house. How excited she was! And she has the little, you know, the the bark, the number thing to open the door to get in to make her life simple. Well, in chalk on the step in front of the door is the number for the code to get in the door so she knows how to get in when she gets home. Like, you're kind of defeating the purpose and don't send this to everybody. <laughs> Go well, she didn't She didn't have a post-it note handy, Adam, so she did it right in Yeah, chalk. exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, there's, I was looking at the attendee list and, and we have everyone from like CISOs and, and people who are just incredibly seasoned executives to people who are straight out of school. And Adam, you touched on something that was kind of interesting that I think might just be of interest to our audience. Could you go a little bit deeper into the difference between verified credentials that are owned by an organization and, and decentralized ID, the true self-sovereign? Sure. Yeah, so I'll pick up Microsoft because that's the easiest one. And mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can really offend them too much. Everyone already has opinions. So enter ID, first off, let's just skip this whole, we just re renamed Azure to enter ID and go back about two months when enter ID really was a piece within the Microsoft Authenticator app where you could have verifiable credentials. So you could validate your driver's license, you could validate your passport, you could validate your your um, 
your transcript from college into a type of a credential that's stored within that wallet that they have. Now they're calling that decentralized ID. And a lot of these other providers are doing the exact same thing is they have a wallet that is theirs, the Microsoft one, the, well, I'll just say, so there's a Microsoft one, there's a ping one, there's a one Cosmos one. I think Hyper's doing it now too. There's a few, they're saying they all have these decentralized IDs, but all they're doing is verifying the credential with a third party and then storing in a wallet that is owned by them. So it's that wallet, that app, that software, that everything, that verified ID is all owned by Microsoft paying one Cosmos, whatever. And then what's happening is there's a trust. So if Microsoft says, oh, I've already validated that this person's ID is legit and you know, I'm just some Joe Schmo SaaS provider, well, I trust Microsoft. So therefore I'm going to let them in kind of like a federation, it's a federated account federation. without having to do the okay. cert transportation. You don't have to, you don't have to do any type of exchange of certs and all that kind of stuff. Cause you're going to trust Microsoft has already validated this stuff out. So that's where it's not really decentralized because it's owned by that provider. If all of a sudden, let's say Microsoft disappears tomorrow, they decide, Oh, we don't really want to run this anymore and it's gone. Well, you lose it and any ideas that are tied to it, but really it's not a created identity that's tied to you. It's something you're verifying a credential, which is a hugely important authentication step that I don't want to dismiss as I'm not trying to sure. undercut it. I just think the terminology is being misused here. And so verifiable credentials, definitely a huge thing, especially for like KYC, AML, or sorry, know your client, anti-money laundering stuff, when you have to verify an identity to a person, huge, massively important. But from a decentralized standpoint, no one should own it. Only you should own your identity. So that's when there's things like MetaMask or Phantom and all these other wallets out there, like from, I'm just using the blockchain ones as example. So I can create hundreds of wallets for free, use one for everything, or I could use one for every different app and I own them. No one else has them. No one can ever take it away from me. And mm -hmm. the company could never get turned off and I control it completely. Now you can control what I have access to. I have, I give you my public key and then you say, hey, okay, well this person based on this blah, 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 they can do all these things. So you can set up the authorization. Or from an authentication standpoint, I'm the only person that has it, and no one can ever touch it besides me. Yeah, but Adam, that goes against the you know the current market conditions that we have. You know, how do we uh, dislodge the incumbents in there? You know, the the major identity uh, holders today. You know, Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, and so on. Is it, is this again a generational thing? You know, how yeah. do we shift from absolutely have, going from the centralized world we have today to something that is more distributed and individualized? Yeah, so a lot of people, like I said, they're already doing it daily. I mean, there's like 180 million authentication events every hour on the blockchain that are happening. So it's like all those people are authenticating and that exact same technology, this, sorry, I'm playing with the lock in my hand, all that same technology, <laughs> is protecting almost two trillion dollars worth of daily transactions so people want to know is it secure how how bulletproof is it is it could we even use it in something like the financial market i mean that's if there was a flaw in it all that money would be liquidated and it's not i mean it's literally what bitcoin ethereum all those are running on the exact that tech so it's already been a proven tech and yes people are absolutely using it but they're using it and a different form of web transactions. Like all the Web3 decentralized applications that are out there all use these decentralized wallets for authentication and authorization. So there's plenty of people using it. We just haven't brought that tech into the enterprise. I mean, enterprise is slow to adopt anything across the board, right? That's nothing new. But I think this is going to be one of those things that's going to be pushed by people. Because especially when you find out like it eliminates the risk of having to hold on to someone's password or social security number or their driver's license. It completely eliminates it altogether. Um, you don't have to pay $50 for a YubiKey for all your people for anti-phishing because wallets are free to generate as many as you want and they're disposable. So you can just scrap it if you think it was ever compromised or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the software is already out there. You can, there's plugins for every browser. It's on every mobile device. I mean, as soon as it, I think in my opinion, as soon as it becomes attached to the phone, like as soon as Google and Apple say, hey, you know what, we're just going to let you like add it to your Apple wallet or your Google wallet. I think that's when that huge shift is going to take place. And it's kind of already is with pass keys because pass keys is that it's creating a public private key transaction for authentication. It's just doing it one per website or one per app versus a decentralized ID where Apple doesn't hold it. I hold it and I can use the same one for multiple sites or I can divvy it up however I want. So it's Really, that's the next transition of going to decentralized identity or decentralized ID login is this kind of passkey stuff. So you're, I think we're already seeing it happen. Yeah, and I think to add to that, like <clears throat> there's a couple of things we have to do is one, and we've always struggled with this in security or identity in, in general, but 
politically correct way to say that we, we got to explain it to the business, right? Th- to break it down, like what this is, right? Adam brought up a real good point where like between decentralized identity and verified credentials and okay, Mark, cover yours. Uh, sometimes what happens is that like the, the marketers kind of get a hold of it and it's like, oh, we're going to market like this. Is this product? Is this product? And the, the, the terms get confused. And then it, but then once it picks up, it's hard to pull back, right? Like, and then, and so now people are confused of what they're calling what, and then we got to break down and explain it. And right now, like if you, if you delve into the world of, of Web3 and decentralized identity, which I would encourage everybody to go do, it's, it's um, for those of you that, that are, that are super technical, that, that got into this and loved it. Like there's so much cool shit that they're doing. Whoops. Sorry. There's so much cool stuff <laughs> that they're doing out there. Right. Like it, it's, it's, like it wasn't seriously, me. it's it's a nerd heaven. It wasn't Adam. It was me. There you go. All right, don't blame me. I was the first one. <laughs> so used to my podcast. Uh, but there's so much cool stuff out there to do, and, and you're seeing how they're doing it with you know public and private key encryption. Like it, a lot of this all comes back to that, right? It, but besides that, there's a lot to go learn. Though. However, right now a lot of this stuff there is very very technical, right? So unless you're like really nerdy and get into that. I, there is a barrier there. And the one, the next step we need to do is kind of create that next abstraction to explain what this is and then deliver that, you know, to the business and explain like how this is really going to work and, and, and how you can transition over. Right. So I think that's, that's one area we have to do is get better at explaining some of this and d- develop kind of the vocabulary to talk about it. The other one is just kind of, I mean, capitalism, right. At the end of the day. Right. So Jerry, I mean, you bring up a good point. Like there, there's no, there's no real reason for Apple or Google or any of these guys to go, yeah, we'll just, this is all free here. Knock yourselves out, right? Yeah. We so we do have to find some reason, some some connection there to kind of get them to do it. Like nobody's gonna build for true decentralized, like the, the infrastructure still has to be built, it still has to be out there. Like nobody's gonna do that for free. Um, then you get into like well, maybe the government can do it. We're not gonna have that conversation. The point is, no matter where you go, right, you're going to find dragons, right? There's going to be problems, and that's like the next biggest part is how do we figure this out? Now, to Adam's point, a lot of people, I mean. There's millions of people out there doing it, right? They're just building themselves. I'll bring back Audius up again. Um, like what I loved is that they've got their infrastructure that they built, but you can also, like you can be a part and join a stream, but you can also kind of host part of your own. They kind of made that easier for you to do that, right? Which is truly the vision behind Decentralized where everybody kind of has a piece of it, right? And that uh, that's also where the power of it comes from because it's not to compromise the entire, you know, the entire platform, like, You've got to, it's not just one place you got to go. It's millions of places you got to go to compromise it, right? And that's just, that yeah. that makes it tougher. Um, and so we, we get some of that security, but there, there is right. some, there's some education that we got to do to kind of bring users to get them comfortable with it. Because right now, if you're not into this, I can see how it feels very kind of sci-fi-ish, right? And then- It does, right? And you got to yeah. think about like passing the mom or dad test too. You know, as we, that's, I think that's kind of the beauty of a pass key, right? Is that- I, I, Finally got my parents able to use a, an iPhone. They're, that's like a, the gateway drug is they're getting into this, so to speak, right? But there is certainly education both on business, which you're talking about, David, but also the consumer side, uh, yeah. you know, as we think well, of it as well. Sorry, the EU's well, already passed I'm regulation on this. They're forcing yeah, right the EU is forcing self-sovereign ID. Like they're leapfrogging. They don't even know what passwordless mm-hmm. is. They're completely oblivious. But they're already going to self-sovereign as being a requirement with all throughout the EU. So we're okay. lagging now. Yeah, well, they, sure. they obviously have a different legal um, construct over there with GDPR and such to mm-hmm. be able to enforce the, these sorts of things. But I'm wondering um, on the enterprise side, if the consumer identity space is the one place where we will go forward with uh, decentralized identity and use verifiable uh, credentials and such. Is Does that Absolutely. sound like a, a good opening oh, You know, for versus, sure. well, <laughs> versus the workforce? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I would say both. Mm-hmm. And so we... I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not. So Ted, you can yell at me later. But so we've created a product where we can tie to any federation tool that's on the market, any enterprise federation tool. And you can use your Web3 wallet or a truly decentralized wallet to log in and authenticate with. So basically your wallet becomes an IDP. So you become your own IDP at this point. So right now, any enterprise could start accepting a web3 wallet as their authentication device and be self-sovereign truly self-sovereign and within about 10 minutes with our completely serverless platform that ties in just like setting up any other idp so if you have federation set up in your enterprise with our little shim you can now have decentralized id and start using it right out of the gate for drop all your yubi keys and never have to store a password again 
I mean, it's, it's super slick. And, 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 and I'm actually interjecting just because uh, in the same vein of what you shared actually a moment ago, Jerry, about um, who's accepting, uh, I actually did have a question from the audience. And I did forget to say that at the beginning of this, please feel free to use the sidebar to add questions as well for, for our panelists, because we want to keep this very interactive. Um, looks like uh, Eli has asked about, are there any government or agencies or private companies accepting verified credential or verifiable credentials, I should say, in lieu of something like a physical driver's license today? It sounds like he's, he's in agreement with you about the Apple, Google Pay uh, adoption, that being a game changer, but on the verified uh, verifiable credential side. Yeah, so the... Um... It's more on the, the verified credential side. So the TSA in some states, right, are accepting mobile driver's license, right? So that rolled out mm -hmm. um, Georgia, California, Colorado, and I can't remember the other ones, right? Um, and the e-passport too, right? Isn't oh, I didn't. Are they doing yeah. e-passport too? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, um, like, I know one coming out of Canada. That was a thing. Yeah. You, could, you don't have to have the actual passport. It's all digital now. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's. I know, so I'll speak for the state of Georgia, like what I do know, I don't know the other ones, right? Like it's a slow rollout. So meaning like, hey, they're they're gonna be okay the fact that I have a, a digital driver's license, right? They're gonna use that to accept to say, yes, this is this is David, what it is. And eventually they're gonna start rolling out some of the, the authorizations on it. Like, what can you authorize based on that? So here's my driver's license, here's, yes, it's still valid. I don't have any you know, speeding tickets. I don't have, you know, whatever, stuff like that or whatever. So they can kind of verify that. Right now, it's just the fact that I have a valid ID. Um, so that's starting to roll out. And I I imagine, and I tend to, listen, I, I look at everything, right? And I tend to look at the caution of like, when I look back across technology, how fast it picks up, um, I do imagine that it's going to, to quickly pick up speed for a lot of these things to be able to verify a lot of these services. Now they do tell you in Georgia right now, you still need to drive with your driver's license like you, because the cops won't take it, but TSA will, eventually that'll go out and pass. But one of the things, and, and Jerry, this is um, kind of to your point, like I, I always look at everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd first. So I love all of the cool stuff, but I also look at the other side of it, the very real people aspect of it. Um, my fear is always that um, with technology and as we advance this, and especially as we've seen this big gap between marginalized communities, like I worry about like the true rollout and mm -hmm. acceptance of everybody to be, get, to be able to get access to this technology. All right. We talk about Apple and Google and kind of what they're doing with those. Like um, the reality is not everybody has like, Apple, Samsung phones or, or iPhones, right? Thousand dollar thing in the pocket. It's yes, they're, they're thousand dollar phones, right? Some yeah, people, but my hundred dollar Android can do it too. This is true, but not all of them can, though, right? Like it's not that. That's my point. Like it's not it's not readily it's not readily accessible down to that level, right? Exactly. Now, when we get it to that point, great. As long as anybody can get to the hardware and can take take advantage of it, I'm great. Right now, that's not the case. And historically, at least when it comes to stuff like this. We don't really pay attention to stuff like that. And we just kind of roll it out. And so then you could continue to create a have and have nots. And, and what scares me most about any of this is that that will accelerate a huge have nots the more this rolls out and you start to put this in front of services, right? Um, what I've seen is in a lot of adoption of this, you know, county so, services. Wait, so you're services. saying they don't have a phone that can do the self-sovereign ID, but they have a computer and internet and can go to these websites. Uh, a lot of people don't, man. There, there's people that don't have there's people that don't have access to the internet. They go to libraries or they go to like McDonald's or other places where they can get it because they don't have access to the internet. But then they wouldn't need the self sovereign ID to go to McDonald's. No, they're, they're not using they're not going to McDonald's to get self sovereign ID. They're going to McDonald's just to get Wi Fi. Wi Fi. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think one you know one of the main principles of the, the, the distributed digital identity uh, world is inclusivity. Uh, so any, almost every article that I look at, you know, brings that up. So uh, certainly that's a, a guiding uh, principle for the movement. We just got to make sure we follow through on that because uh, well, these things know, are 50 bucks a pop. This mm -hmm. is the most expensive password protector I've ever seen. And many companies require these things all day long. So is this worse? I don't think it's an either or kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so for, from the enterprise perspective, it's it's totally different, right? Like the, the employees aren't, it's the enterprise that has to bear the cost of doing that, right? Yeah. So you don't, like YubiKeys aren't aren't for like the average other person, like to get access to whatever services, like county services, stuff, things like that, what they need, right? So that that's the areas that I look at, right? As we start to, it, as this gets bigger, we roll this out, like county services, local government services, they have lower budgets, right? Like stuff like this really accelerates them and helps them do a lot of things faster. That's great. But the people they uh -huh. serve, right? 
often do not have near the resources that most of us have in this tech field, right? And so it's just mm-hmm. it's just one of those things that we have to think about, right? Same like trying to if you if you go to a different country and try and roll out you know a data heavy app, right? We're used to four G or whatever the hell LT whatever the heck, 5G, whatever the heck we have now, right? That barely freaking works, but whatever. That's what they call it. Like, you know, you travel overseas and it's and it's not the same, right? So it's, it's just those things that we have to think of, right? Like sometimes the biggest point and not trying to get this down as rabbit hole is that we tend to create technology in a bubble, right? And we, uh-huh. and we only do kind of do like best case because it's like, oh, well, everybody has this or this, that or whatever. And it's that thinking that sometimes gets us into trouble. And as we start yeah. to build services like this that can impact such a broader aspect of the community, we have to make sure we're checking ourselves with that. I love that. And actually, Sal in the audience here, I'm, I'm going to call you out, Sal. This is a great point. You just said the point is building to the common denominator. If a service will be uh, public facing, it has to include access for under uh, resourced communities. And it's 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 a fact, you know, it's as we think about that. You, you, David, you brought up some really valid points. And actually, further up, uh, I think Michael just talked about, boy, what happens when your battery dies? <laughs> there's like there's a part of like device loss also that that also you know, whether you don't have a device in the first place, I mean, device loss could also be, a, 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 you can't get into things. And so as we think about pass keys, I, I, this has come up a couple of times, are, are pass keys the next great thing or is it the flavor of the moment? And I'm just curious, I, I, that's a naive question on my part as your host, but I'm mm-hmm. kind of curious, is, is, is there something better than pass keys? I mean, obviously we have the adoption of the big platforms as they're saying device wise, you know, Android, uh, Google, uh, Apple and all that. Is there something beyond it? Well, it probably is because, you know, the speed of innovation is, is so amazing right now. And, um, you know, like David was just saying, we had LTE, 4G, now 5G. And the same thing with, uh, you know, going, we just thought multi-factor was the thing some years ago, but now there's so many different flavors of multi-factor or, or stronger authentication. You know, Passkeys is just the latest innovation there, the latest iteration of that. Um, it sounds like we're going to have quite a mix of, of different technologies going forward and yeah they'll keep advancing i think that's part of the challenge you know can our tech uh, you know our tech stack our capabilities keep up with this innovation uh, as well you know do i need to have the latest iphone to use pass keys um you know how much of it's going to be backward compatible you know some of these technology changes you know require us to to upgrade to the latest hardware and that's where you know uh, well, maybe I want to use my phone that's still five years old and works fine. Why, you know, what, what's the cost benefit for me to, you know, to upgrade? So, um, yeah, well, I think, I think, I think it's just the latest innovation. It's a personal option, like biometrics. Like if you have Face ID, if you have the fingerprint reader, it's like, it's another, you could use that instead. It's like, I don't want to use my password all the time. I'm just going to use my fingerprint or I'm going to use my Face ID. To me, this is just another form of that. Pass keys, decentralized ID, whatever. It's just another mm-hmm. optional form that you have to authenticate yourself in a more secure way if you want to. Well, it's it, it's a valid point, and, and I think as we get back into you know the topic with with Tom, as we're going to get into you know back into actually getting through the lock, David, you've talked about this. Adam, you've talked about this. Jerry, you've talked about this. Is the fact that you know we're going to be talking about picking a lock and using ways to get in, but if someone gives you the key. You don't need to do any of that. And, and that's what we're seeing in a lot of these most recent breaches. And I'm sure, Tom, you can speak to this when you walk us through this as a pen tester, is the fact that, you know, I, I forget which company uses this, but I thought it was pretty good. Is like the newest hackers aren't hacking in, they're logging in. And it's true because you have to think about the human element to a lot of what's going on. Um, you know, w- without naming, you know, any vendors, it, we think about companies, MGM, it, it, was, it, it comes down to almost like a training and a human resource conversation that, that's, that's taking place. And you as a pen tester know that most clearly, I think, Tom, do you not? Oh, I can tell you that um, whilst I'm going to teach you to pick logs, um, I would say 90% of what I do on my job is convincing people to do stuff that they're not supposed to do. So it's, <laughs> it, it, it's convincing people to give me access to things, hand over that key, hand over that password, open that door for me. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like there's a, a human resource uh, element to, to identity training that, that needs to be really be reinforced as well as, as we think across this, you know. And so what, what I'd love to do as we're like just keeping track of time for a moment here, I'd love to segue back to Tom for a moment because I know that we've all been kind of like fidgeting and playing with the locks. Um, and then we're going to come back to our panelists and talk a little bit about where you all would think resource wise, where you want us to go and also to answer any additional questions that we get from the audience. So Tom, I'd love to give you the floor now 
and walk us through this process. All right, sounds good. Sorry about leaving you on that nasty cliffhanger earlier. I'm not sorry at all. I love it. I'm I'm super into soap soap operas, so this just this just makes me feel so good. And as a as a social engineer, I love the the psychology of it. Okay, well, let's just jump straight back into our lock then. Now, I left you on I think the term is tenterhooks, uh, when we have just described this entire lock and we described how this key works, and so. Um, I'm going to I'm going to assume that we don't have this key, right? We're going to throw this key away now. Don't actually throw it away. Like keep it keep it close by. It's quite handy, right? Uh, also, if you happen to have any of these keys as well, these keys don't work <laughs> on this padlock. Um, I know it came up earlier, and I just couldn't resist that joke right there. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to go into our toolkit. We are going to recreate that key using some tools. So you should have a leather wallet. Um, I don't think it's actual leather, but you know, a pleather wallet that we sent out to you. Um, and there should be a bunch of tools in there. Now there are more tools than we will ever need for this session here. I wanted to make sure that you have a heap of tools so that when, if I do my job correctly, this becomes an amazing hobby that you keep going for years and years on, you've got tons of tools to be able to fall back on if you come across a weird lock. So we're gonna go into our toolkit and we are gonna find a tool that looks like this to start with. Let me go a little bit closer so you can see that. It's got a little diamond on the end of it or a triangle on the end. It's called a half diamond pick. Now, you may have noticed that this kind of looks like the tooth of a key. Well, it's going to recreate the tooth of a key. What we're actually going to do is we're going to use this tool to manipulate these pins. So make sure you've got that tool out. So for those of you in the US, it's number 15, it's stamped on it. Uh, elsewhere in the world, you might have a different number or no number at all, but just thought I'd give the, the US attendees a little tip there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this to manipulate these pins. And I wanna stress to start with, if you look at how I'm holding this, <clears throat> you'll see that I'm just holding it in two fingers. It's nice and light. I wanna stress finesse over force when it comes to lock picking in general. If you're wedging this thing in and twisting it and pulling it up and down and backwards and forwards and it's getting jammed, you run the risk of breaking it. Now look at it, it's only a tiny thin piece of metal and that's by design because we want to give you tactile feedback through this thing. It's supposed to be an extension of your hand. Just be careful though, because it's so thin, it is quite delicate. So finesse over force when it comes to lock picking. So I've got this in two fingers here. All I'm going to do is I'm going to insert this into the keyway and you'll see with just two fingers, it slides in and out really, really nicely, really, really gently. I've got this nice and vertical, no up and down movement, no twisty movement, no forward and back movement, just in and out like that. If I just apply a small amount of downward pressure when it's in, you'll see I can start to get to my pins. So you see those pins start to move up and down. If you've got to that stage, congratulations. You've now found a way to recreate the teeth and more specifically the grooves in between the teeth of your key. So I can just go back and forwards and you see these bounce up and down. Now let's go back in time a little bit. When we had our key in, we have all of these pins nicely aligned. So like I said earlier, what that does is this pin and the pin inside of our tumbler the gap in between them nicely aligns with the edge of the tumbler called the shear line right here. So we want to put our key in and make a mental note of where those pins are. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use this pick to push them up and down to get to get them to the exact position that they need to be so that they recreate the teeth of that key. So we want them in this position. Okay, pulling our key out again, throwing it away. So what we can do so we can go into this lock and we can start pushing those pins up and down. And, you know, I could start to move this one here. I could maybe get it to that position. I could get number four down probably to about there. That's about where it, where it should be. Onto the next one. If I push it hard enough, you can actually see that gap in between those two pins. So I've gone too far there, but I'm going to let off a little bit. Number three is probably around there. Now, what you probably have noticed here is that I'm going back and forwards like this and they're springing back into position. So we can get them into the right spot, but unfortunately they don't stay there. So we need a second tool in order to be able to catch that pin in place. And it also does a, a number of things, it does two things. So we're gonna go into our kits 
and we're going to find this tool right here. If you have multiples of these, just find the biggest one. This is called a tension bar. You may hear it called a pry bar, a force bar, an S bar, a snake bar. It doesn't really matter what you call it. I just end up calling it a tension bar. Now, this does two things. Let's take a look at our key again. If we put our key in the lock, yes, the pin's nicely aligned, but nothing else happens. We have to turn the key in order to open that lock. So the pick is not gonna do that. It's not strong enough to turn the lock and it just wouldn't work anyway. So this tension bar is used to turn the lock. And all we do with the biggest end is we insert that into the keyway. We wanna get it up as high away from the springs and the pins as we can get it. There's not much room in there. So it's not gonna be significant, the amount that you can get it away from the pins, but you just wanna try and get it up to the top of the keyway. And then all we do is we apply clockwise pressure to it. So side view looks like this, gets to about, uh, that's somewhere between one and two o'clock, probably. Maybe that's one o'clock, actually. So get to about one o'clock, and then I apply a tiny bit more pressure to it. I like to describe it as as much pressure as it would take to turn a key in a lock or push a key on a keyboard. So that's our pressure. Now, what this actually has a side effect of doing, which is very convenient for us, is when we start to move our pins up and down, because we've got pressure on this tension bar, What's going to happen is when you get your pin into the correct position, it's going to click into, uh, into its spot and it's going to get caught there by this tension bar. So what I'll do is I'll show you. I'll do a nice close up view here. My tension bar is in. I'm going to put my pick in with my diamond facing down towards those pins. I'm going to put tension on that lock and I'm just going to go back and forwards across those pins. So you see how I'm moving back and forwards and every now and then one of them will jump into position and it will stay there and they'll start to line up. Now it's actually looking pretty good right there. That's looking fairly well aligned. So all I need to do is put a little bit more pressure on this tension bar and look at that, it's moving and the lock pops open. Okay, I am gonna do that one more time. So right from the start, tension bar goes in, the bigger end of the tension bar up to the top of the keyway. My pick goes in, diamond facing down, all the way to the back. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put tension on this tension bar and I'm gonna to start to move back and forwards across those pins and you'll see them moving up and down. And every now and then one of them will catch into position. Now the position order could be one, six, five, three, four, two, or it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, or it could be six, five, four, three, two, one. You've all got different locks, they all work different ways, but you're gonna be able to go back and forwards over these gently and you'll feel movement. You'll feel movement in your tension bar and you'll feel movement in your pick. If you're lucky and you don't have a headset on, you'll hear a click as well. And you'll get them aligned. And then what should happen is you'll feel a bit more movement on this tension bar and the lock will pop open. Okay, I have done that a million times. That's why I make it look really, really easy. I'm gonna set you off to practice this right now, but I'm gonna give you a few caveats and a few tips before we do that. So first off, let's take a look at the lock itself. You'll notice there are seven pins in it here. So let me go look closer. Seven pins, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now this seventh pin, you can ignore. You can't actually even get to that one. It's a structural pin that stops this tumbler turning round and round in circles. So you're gonna focus on pins six, five, four, three, two, one. The way I like to do it is I set up and I go all the way into the back first to pin number six and I start there and I move to number one and I go back and forwards. It's much easier than starting outside. Now, the second thing is, is you've been seeing a nice close up view of this lock on my screen. Now, if I take my stand away and then I bring it back close to my body, you'll see how far away it is. So that's at arm's length for me. It's really far away. It looks cool on the camera, but it's really hard to pick that way. So the actual technique I would recommend is to bring it closer to your face so that you can see inside of it. I like to hold it with my, this is my left hand, so my non-dominant hand, and then I use my pointer finger for the tension bar. Then I hold the pick like a pencil, and I like to anchor my middle finger or my ring finger on the padlock so that everything moves together. If I hold it like this, the pick's moving independently, the lock is moving independently. I can twist it. I can push it back and forwards. It can get jammed easily. It's much harder. Yep. 
if I anchor my finger against it, I move my padlock hand, my pick hand goes with it, <clears throat> excuse me, and vice versa. So that's my tip for you there. You apply a bit of tension, you move back and forwards over those picks, and hey, presto, your lock opens. Again, I've done I, forget, I forget what this last one is, the last number, but what happens if it feels like you can't get it past the last one out as you're raking it back and forth? Is it is the, the one closest to the outside harder? So the, pin number one, um, there's two things you can do there. One is you can let off tension a little bit so that you're not pushing quite so hard on this tension bar. The other thing is, is you can do, put, put a little bit of downward movement like that. Let me get in focus here. Hang on, I'll put my, my stand back there. It's much easier to see. So if we push down with the pick like that, you'll see how it manipulates pins one and two and three. So that can sometimes help you. A little bit of downward movement. Now, I'm not talking about this kind of movement, crazy okay. movement like that. Just a little bit of downward movement there. Or let off this tension bar. Now, when it comes to the tension bar, set it once and hopefully forget about it. What you're going to do is you're going to apply your tension on this tension bar. And I want you to, if you can, forget about this hand. Focus on this hand. Keep that tension steady. I don't want you doing this kind of movement. I don't want you going back and forwards. Keep that, that tension sturdy on there and keep it steady. And then focus on this hand. Now, the final thing. Out of our pool of locks, there's about 150 different ones. You may have a really, really easy lock. You may have a really, really difficult lock. It sort of depends on the lock of the draw, really. If it takes you a while to get this first lock, don't worry about it. Sometimes it takes a little longer because the lock's harder or, hey, it's a new skill. It takes a while to learn. If you get it immediately, you may have an easy lock or you just might be naturally good at this. I'll take both answers as a correct one. I love it. Um, so How's the I, audience doing? let's look at the audience and I've seen four or five people say that they've got it. If you've got yeah. it, let us know. Let's. So what I actually want you to do is pick it once, lock it again, pick it twice, lock it again, pick it thrice, then type the number three in the chat. So I want to see how many people have picked it three times because the first two, just going to assume maybe there was a bit of fluke involved, but if you've done it three times, then you've definitely learned it. Good luck. Adam, I think I saw a bit of flexing from you on the camera there. Did you get it a few times? This is the only one I haven't got yet. Was this this cross one? Oh, okay. So Do you the, have any hints for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, having a, a box of tissues, Kleenex nearby to mop up your tears <laughs> is, is a really <laughs> handy one to have because that is a nightmare of a lock. Uh, yeah. What I will do, rather than uh, just do, be a bit distracting in this session, I will send you a link on how to do that one. It Perfect. is a very difficult lock that took me about an hour to do the first time, and yeah. I needed two tension bars for it. it okay. You get them both in there? I love it. You, you know, and, and to that end, you we're actually going to send everyone that link, just so that everybody knows. We're going to send a, a follow-up link with uh, another video that Tom has, because the last thing we want is anyone to have to, you know, what do I do with all my other kits? This is your gateway drug, so to speak, into <laughs> getting these things open and a new hobby. And being that it's Christmas, or Thanksgiving time, I should say. <laughs> Hopefully this makes for some really interesting uh, holiday meal conversations. You may dread having your in-laws over, but you can just show them this and say, ha, 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 or however you want to couch that with the family. Uh, look at all the people who are getting this. This is awesome. Yeah, this is awesome. Congratulations, everybody. I'm so proud of tons of you. There's too many to mention right now. Clearly, I was never cut out for this. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm with you, David. <laughs> I just Jimmy locks with me all the credit card. This is a whole different nice. world. Yeah, when these showed up uh, like about a week ago or so, um, I pulled them out. I was like, oh, what is this? What did my wife order on Amazon? I was like, oh, it's for me. Nice. And then uh, so at night, I, I sat the kids and I was like, okay, today we're going to learn how to pick locks. And my wife's like, what? This is not. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. So now my eight year old, my 12 year old, all they do is I, I borrowed this kit back from them because they just were running around trying to pick every lock imaginable. Now my daughter, doesn't use a key. She uses the pick set to get in to, from home from school. I, I can't begin to tell you what a massive mistake that was that you, you did there. <laughs> well, no, I have biometric stuff on other things, so it's okay. For oh, that. wow. Okay. But, but it's got them thinking like, I don't need a key. There's another way into this. So, yeah. Now, I'll do a quick jump in here. Uh, I see a lot of people have got it three times. If you want to make this a lot more difficult for yourself, Take the lock, set up as normal, wrap your hand around it so that you can't see inside of it. Because a real life lock, 
is not going to look anything like the clear plastic ones that we've sent you. It's going to look like this. And a way to recreate that is to wrap your hand around it so that you can't see inside of it. And so it's going to look like this when you bring it up and you're going to feel your way through that lock. You're going to feel for the pops. You're going to feel for the clicks. And hopefully you're going to get all of those pins open. Again, I've done this a million times. Don't feel like you have to do it that quick. I'm just flexing now. Yeah, you... This is the Identity Hero series and, and the first of uh, many to come. I would love to know from our audience, if you had a, an identity superhero alter ego, what would it be? Think about, oh, I like this. Pick the master lock. So as we think about what your identity alter ego superhero would be, we've already got the IDM Rockstar. We've got the uh, identity Jedi. What might be your identity superhero alter ego? I think I got one of the hard locks, Tom. I was I was hoping to be like the host is just like, no big deal. I got this. Um, having some issues here. But you know what? I'm going to be playing with this for a long time. So how long would this take you in, in real life to an unknown lock, just out of curiosity, Tom, uh, one of a similar shape? Oh, that is a great question because there are so many different types of padlocks out there. Um, somebody just said, pick the master lock. Now, this actually has security pins in it, which are a bit of a nightmare to pick. They are, uh, I believe this one has spool pins in it. Now, I can try and show this on my screen. I've got a little animation for a spool pin, but we're squares. So we'll, we'll see if this fits. You can kind of see it on my screen. Let me see if I can maybe move this around a little bit. And I'll move oh, you're speaking out. to the inner nerds here. Yeah, this is this is getting good. Like this uh, is the there we go. Like, this right, is work. Discovery Channel. So um, when I come across a lock in the wild, uh, you might have something like this, which is a spool pin, which uh, it, it essentially makes it much more difficult to pick. So if I come across something like this, it might take me 15 minutes to get into a, a lock like this. But a standard kind of lock with no security pins, something like that. Um, oh, the average, it might take me a couple of minutes to get into, into it. Uh, there's some pretty easy locks out there. But like I said earlier, I would rather talk my way in through a lock. I would rather talk my way into a building. Um, I would rather have someone fob their way in so that I don't have to be on my knees picking a lock in the middle of an office when somebody walks past and goes, what are you doing? Exactly. Well, and, and I think every, I would encourage everyone to take a look at the, the Anarchy Series podcast and, as well as yours, the Identity Jedi, because you guys talk about this all the time, about if you talk someone into giving you the key, don't oh, yeah. do away with the kit. It's a whole lot easier that way. The weakest link is your weakest call center person. Yeah, pretty yes. much. <laughs> I mean, That's look exactly at MGM and Boeing. <laughs> well, tell you what, I, I, in, in, in the interest of time, I would love to get some parting thoughts from, from our panelists, you know, so as you're thinking, and actually, Tom, maybe one from you as well at the end here, um, but from our panelists, if you're thinking through, we've got people on this call who are, again, I talked about, there's, there's seasoned execs on here who know what they're doing, there are people who are pivoting and, and following a new career, uh, there's, there's people fresh out of school, if you look back at your pre-identity hero super self, and so we're thinking back 15, 17, 20 years ago, what advice might you have given yourself now as you look at a, a career in, in identity and, and what resources might you use today to, uh, to help further your you know, personal development? Uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, I can go first uh, while, you're, while you're thinking there, Adam. I can yeah, go first. Sure. It's, please. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say for, for me, it was having uh, some mentors that would be a, a source of knowledge and support and information and also willing to push me into the deep end of, of the pool for different projects or different uh, things going on. Uh, these days, you know, there's the ID Pro organization, which is relatively new, but it's specifically for people that are new to the identity world and, you know, how to, how to get started, how to join a community. And, and get support and be able to ask questions of your peers. And um, if you're really more advanced and definitely in deep into the decentralized ID and SSI, self-sovereign identity, then Internet Identity Week, or workshop rather, Internet Identity Workshop is your place, IIW. That's where all the, the cool kids go that are talking about that, uh, those topics and really um, talking about specific details and new protocols, new profiles, and so on. Adam, did that? Okay. You know, now, those are now I got something. By the way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first off, what I would tell myself way back then, 
I don't think it's really relevant now. I think the, the identity landscape has changed so much in the last 20 years from when I first started doing this stuff. But some of the maybe foundational stuff that would still apply would be set up your own lab, get hands on with the product, try to break it as much as possible. And don't be limited by what the vendor tells you is possible, right? Like there's a world of technology out there that's not that particular software you're working on that you could probably use some way into this stuff. Like, I mean, this the whole breaching, like the MGM breach and all this help desk stuff with people like, you know, getting, you know, MFA stuff reset and when they shouldn't be. Well, this is a prime example where orchestration could have come in place with verifiable credentials or with a decentralized ID. Because if a help desk guy says, hey, I'm going to try to reset this password and it goes through some type of an orchestration flow that says, okay, well, this is a restricted account or sort of admin account or something. Therefore, you need to prompt this guy for a biometric return or you need to prompt this guy for something in addition more than just trusting whatever he says on the phone. And this way, the help desk guy can't just do it because he just wants to go home or he's bored or doesn't know what he's doing or gets swindled into it. It will not allow him to move forward with it unless he actually possesses the, you know, the, the correct information. So build, break, try it, see what works and, see, and push the limits, see what, see what you can do with it. Yeah, break everything. I love it. I love it. David, are we, are we breaking things or what you, what's your advice to, to people if they're looking to uh, advance their careers? Yeah, quit, become a lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm just saying. No, uh, I, I mean, that's what I told myself. I was like, dude, just go to law school. Trust me. Anyway, um, but so I, yes, um, so a little bit of, um, you know, backstory with this. I, I agree with Adam, like, get as get as much as you can and play around with it i think it's, it's a little bit harder now because a lot of the vendors have this stuff just kind of locked down you can't get to the software as much as you could before um when i was starting um hilariously enough adam used to do um put videos out there um like and i will never forget like this, this his he saved me hours and hours of work there's a video <laughs> he did like he was like installing oracle i think it was oh, oracle man. access manager yeah. from scratch she goes and in the in the title this is like early youtube days he's like he goes even with the mess ups like he just recorded him doing it because it's, I'm, I'm dating both it was like 14 right hours like, too it was brutal yeah, <laughs> like, because you had to go through all these steps and if you did it the wrong way like it would mess up and this this stuff wasn't documented so anyway what i would say is definitely like um get access to as much as you can i think you know for um Forge Rock used to have that. They're open source. I think that's still out there. There's stuff like open out, open directories, things like that. Set yourself up a lab as much as possible to dig in. And, and um, you've got to be in this field, you got to be curious. And one thing I, I, I was thinking about this when, when Tom was breaking down the lock. I suck at this stuff, by the way. I can't get this thing open. So I'll never, <laughs> don't have to worry about me breaking into your house. But like um, the cool thing about this transparent lock, and I'm going to put it close to the camera, like the cool thing about it. And this is, think about this like identity systems and stuff like that. Is this whole thing is a system, right? So yes, there's the key when it goes in there and the pins and he showed us all that, but I was paying attention to like when it opened, like there's this little catch gadget up here with the spring that pops open the padlock that comes out. There's a spring in the, in the back where when you press it back down, like how it catches that, right? So there's the actual lock itself and there's the rest of the mechanisms that are moving with it, right? Like identity and security is the same way. There's all these other mechanisms that go with it. So when you dive into this, um, ID Pro is a great resource um, because you can you can learn from the different experts, but like learn everything. So learn what a directory is, learn what PKI is, learn what access management is, and learn how all these things come together and work because then you'll be able to see like all the little creases. And when things break, you'll know like, okay, well, this, this is broken. So why is this happening? Like, why am I getting forwarded to this? You know, Federation server, like what, what is actually going on here? The more you understand how all of this kind of comes together, um, the more you can kind of poke holes and stuff. And then like the more you learn how, how it all works and, and how it's supposed to work. So um, get curious, ask questions. And then for new people coming in, um, ask all the questions, right? Don't be afraid to ask questions. A lot of us have been doing this a long time. Look, Jerry said it, like we get older, we get cynical. We just seen shit and we're just, God, did it again. sorry. We just seen stuff and we're just like, uh, we tried that 15 years again. ago. It's never going to work. Right. So again, it wasn't Adam. It was me. It was all day. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. We're keeping track. <laughs> um, but like question everything. Right. And, and ask questions of like, why it is that way? Because we're, we're at this pinnacle point, this, this point in identity where as we adopt all this new technology, we're going to need new ways of things. And sometimes it's going to take those questions to get some of us old farts to be like, well, yeah, maybe it doesn't have to be like that anymore. So mm -hmm. ask questions, build as much as you can and, and have fun. And if it all you know, fails, just go 
go become a lawyer or something. They get paid. I was going to say, it. forget being a lawyer. You're going to be a college professional because you're doing a great job here, David. I was going to say, <laughs> if I had my advice, it's go watch YouTube <laughs> webcasts. They're awesome. I've learned so much just like following that. Um, you mentioned ID Pro, Jerry. You know, there's the body of knowledge document that just got put out. Boy, like just things that you think you know everything, and then you go back and you learn even more. There's just all these great resources. And I think my favorite part about identity anymore is that it used to be this like very secretive thing where nobody wanted to talk about it for fear of like, oh no, no, that's like all everyone knows everything that's going on. Everyone's very open right now about doing the right thing. And so as we're talking about like mentors or asking questions, people want to talk and they want to share and, and we're learning from each other. You know, there's a, an openness of information that's really valuable to us right now, whether you're evaluating vendors or just trying to understand the technology better, people want to talk and share that knowledge. And so it's, it's, it's great. You know, that's where we're going with the identity space. It's, it's a lot of fun. Where are we going with the penetration testing space, Tom? Any, any advice on picking these locks? Oh, as far as picking the locks, I think we can get you um, some links to send out to to take the next steps. Um, I would definitely, um, I definitely say that um, I, I'm going to be contactable after this. If you have any more questions for me, um, do we have any time to actually uh, touch on the locks again and play around with them at the end? We certainly could. And and one thing I was just going to call out um, <clears throat> for everybody: we'll have the recording of this going out later. Also, there's um, contact info, uh, the podcast uh, addresses, everything. Do a quick screenshot of the chat off to the right, because I think there's a lot of really good resources over there uh, for everybody to, to follow. And, yes. dot com. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. Um, Tom, I can't get in. I, I, like, I feel like I'm going to break the tension. Am I pushing too hard if I'm, I feel like I'm going to break the tension bar? You won't break the tension bar. You'll bend it. You'll break the lock before you break the uh, the tension bar. Okay. Um, the, what will happen is if you push the tension bar too hard, then the pins won't move up and down at all. They'll just seize in place. So you'll know you've gone too far if you can't push any of the pins. But if you can, then you're at probably the right tension. But again, like I said, there's enough tension to turn a key in a lock or push a key on a keyboard is the amount of tension that I like to say. Practice, Mark, we'll that's all it's that. going to take. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Well, I, we could do this all day, honestly. And as you said, we're going to have the information in the um, follow-up emails for everybody mm -hmm. so they can get a hold of you. Also, more importantly, our panelists, David, Adam, Jerry, this was awesome. I, and I, I mean this genuinely. Like, I look up to you guys, and I've learned so much about identity from you guys. And to have you on with us today has been a, a real honor. And, and thank you, our audience, for spending your time with us. Hopefully everyone's going to be able to pull these out at Thanksgiving dinner and show some new cool tricks that they've learned along the way. And, and hopefully everyone's learned some new stuff about identity today as well. So without further ado, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us again. This is the first in the Identity Hero series. There's much more to come. Stay tuned. We'll keep everyone posted. Check out Identity Jedi. Check out the Anarchy Series podcast. And Jerry, you and I need a cool name next. So we'll, we'll come up with one. <laughs> That's your Thanks job, everyone Mark. for joining us. Have a great one. Bye, everybody. Everybody.